Tonight, tragedy in Russia. Gunmen launch coordinated attacks in Dagestan, targeting synagogue, churches and police, resulting more than 16 dead, including 15 officers and a priest. Trilateral exercises. South Korea, United States and Japan are set to conduct their first ever trilateral multi-domain exercise this week, aiming to enhance security cooperation against North Korean provocations. Severe conditions. Millions endure scorching heat across US, while floodwaters hit Midwest. California braces for triple-digit temperatures, while towns evacuate due to rising waters. And historic discovery. Archaeologists discovered 35 18th-century bottles of preserved fruit, including intact vessels with cherries and berries at George Washington's Mount Vernon estate. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We have some key updates to report to you in the beginning of this week and we start in Russia with the tragic attack that happened in Russia's Dagestan. The cities of Debent and Machalaka have experienced severe attacks on police officers, churches and synagogues during the Orthodox festival of Pentecost and have resulted in multiple fatalities. Over a dozen police officers and several civilians are among the dead, with six attackers killed and authorities were actively pursuing others involved throughout the day. In a series of devastating attacks, police posts, churches and a synagogue in Russia's North Caucasus Republic of Dagestan was targeted, resulting in the deaths of 19 police officers and several civilians. Violence also claimed the lives of six gunmen while at least 16 individuals were hospitalized with injuries. These attacks, which appeared to be coordinated, took place in the cities of Derbent and Makhachkala during the Orthodox festival of Pentecost. Among the victims was Father Nikolai Kotelnikov, an Orthodox priest who had served in Derbent for over 40 years. His identity was confirmed by the head of the Republic of Dagestan, Sergei Melikov. Social media footage captured scenes of chaos as people dressed in dark clothing fired at police cars. Emergency service vehicles were seen rushing to the scenes. In Derbent, known for its ancient Jewish community, gunmen attacked a synagogue and a church, subsequently setting both buildings on fire. Dagestan, a predominantly Muslim republic in southern Russia, neighboring Chechnya, has a history of Islamist attacks. The current assailants have not been officially identified, but Russian media reports suggest that among them were Osman and Avdil, sons of Magomed Omarov, the head of the Sergokalinsky district near Machakchala. Omarov has since been detained by police. In the wake of the tragedy, Dagestan has declared three days of mourning as the region grapples with the impact of the violent assault. South Korea, the US and Japan are conducting a trilateral multi-domain exercise for the first time this week. Experts say North Korea recently coming out from the summit with Russia may react strongly against the drill, calling it a war practice. A nuclear-powered U.S. aircraft carrier, the USS Theodore Roosevelt, arrived in Busan over the weekend ahead of a three-way military exercise between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan. The Freedom Edge exercise aims to strengthen military training against North Korean provocations. The Freedom Edge exercise features simultaneous drills in surface, underwater, aerial and cyber warfare. This week's exercise was announced when the defense chiefs of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan met in Singapore earlier this month. The exercise comes as the North's leader Kim Jong-un gains confidence after a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin last week and on top of that, the signing of a pact that pledges mutual defense assistance in the event of war. Experts say it's possible Pyongyang would react strongly to the exercise. North Korea, meanwhile, is expected to hold a key meeting of its ruling Workers' Party this week to discuss follow-up measures to implement the partnership agreement with Russia. 
Officials from both sides said that Russia and Ukraine traded attacks which resulted in casualties overnight and into yesterday. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, at least five people were killed, including three children, in a Ukrainian attack on Crimea yesterday, which said the supply of missiles made the United States responsible for the attack. For more updates on this, let's join other than a World News Special Correspondent Shanukadar Maratna reporting from Whiteberg in Belarus. Shanuka? Yes. Report says that one person was also killed and 10 others were wounded by the Russian strikes on the Ukraine's eastern city of Kharkiv. The Russia Defense Ministry said that the Ukraine attack on Russian-occupied Crimean Peninsula was conducted with five U.S.-supplied Army Tacticals missile system missiles. It added that four had been shot down and the fifth had detonated in the mid-air. The ministry claimed that the U.S. specialist had set the missile's flight coordinates on the basis of information from U.S. spy satellites. There has been no response from U.S. which began supplying Ukraine with the missiles earlier this year. Footage aired on Russian state television showed people running from the beach and some people being carried off sun launchers. Authorities in Crimea said missile fragments had fallen near a beach on the north side of the city, Sevastopol. Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, though most of the world still considers the territory part of Ukraine. Back to you. Thank you. And that was other than a World News Special Correspondent Shanuka Dharmaratna reporting from Whitesburg in Belarus. Still related to the conflict, EU Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell said today upon his arrival at EU Foreign Minister's meeting that the European Union has found a way to use proceeds from frozen Russian assets to buy arms for Ukraine, despite holdups from Hungary. European Union governments agreed in May to use profits from the assets frozen inside the bloc to help Ukraine with 90% of funds earmarked for the military aid. But diplomats say that Hungary has been holding up approval for the necessary legal measures. Hungary maintains warmer relations with Moscow than any other EU country. It does not give arms to Ukraine and Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has criticized the EU and NATO members for doing so, saying they are fueling the war. With the first tranche to proceeds worth 1.4 billion euros due next week, EU officials had been scrambling for a way to allow the funds to be used immediately to help Ukraine defend itself from Russian invasion. Borrell said EU officials had now found a way to approve the measures without needing the consent of any member country that abstained from the original decision. The EU's plan for the immediate use of profits for the frozen Russian assets is separate from a decision by G7 leaders this month to use future proceeds to fund $50 billion in loans to Ukraine. According to state media, a senior North Korean military official criticized the US today for boosting military and aid to Ukraine, interpreting it as a gesture of support for Moscow in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Washington and Seoul are both worried about the possibility of heightened military cooperation between Moscow and Pyongyang. A top North Korean military official on Monday criticized the U.S. for increasing military aid to Ukraine, according to state media, a show of support for Moscow in the ongoing Ukraine war. A recent pact between Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un announced during Putin's visit to Pyongyang last week commits both countries to provide immediate military assistance in the case of aggression against either one of them, potentially enabling arms trading and strengthening their anti-US alliance. Both Washington and Seoul are concerned about the prospect of increased military cooperation between Moscow and Pyongyang and have accused them of already violating international laws by trading arms for use against Ukraine. Russia and North Korea deny these claims. North Korea's Pak Jong Chan, the top official speaking in state media Monday, warned of a potential strong response from Moscow if the US pushes Ukraine towards a proxy war against Russia, possibly leading to a new world war. He referred to comments by the Pentagon last week that Ukrainian forces can use US-supplied weapons to strike Russian forces anywhere across the border into Russia. In a joint statement released the same day by Seoul's foreign ministry, officials from South Korea, the US and Japan strongly condemn the deepening military ties between North Korea and Russia. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared on Sunday that the intense phase of the conflict with Hamas in Gaza is approaching its conclusion. He emphasized that attention would soon turn to Israel's northern border with Lebanon, where clashes with the Iran-backed Hezbollah have escalated in recent weeks. Speaking in an interview with an Israel channel, Netanyahu clarified that while the intense phase of fighting in Rafah is ending, the border conflict is not yet over. He outlined plans to redeploy some forces to the northern areas after this phase ends, primarily defensive purposes and to facilitate the return of displaced residents. Netanyahu reiterated his stance against the agreement to a comprehensive ceasefire deal, instead suggesting openness to a partial agreement aimed at securing the release of some hostages held in Gaza and ultimately aiming to dismantle the Hamas regime. Netanyahu said that if fewer soldiers are needed in Gaza soon, more troops could be deployed on the border with Lebanon. There have been almost daily exchanges of strikes between Iranian-backed Hezbollah and the Israeli army since the Hamas terror cross-border attack on 7th October 2023 that triggered the Gaza war. Israel and Hezbollah have been exchanging fire nearly every day since then, but the fighting has escalated in recent weeks, raising fears of full-blown war. Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight, Donald Trump made two speeches on Saturday, urging Christian supporters to go to the polls for him one last time. He also quoted black waters in Philadelphia by promising to fix the city ravaged by bloodshed, even as data shows a decline in violent crime. Donald Trump made a compelling appeal to black and Hispanic voters in Philadelphia, emphasizing his commitment to tackling crime and revitalizing the city. These communities, which constitute over half of Philadelphia's population, are a focal point of his campaign strategy. Recent opinion polls suggest that Trump is gaining traction among these voter groups, encouraging his campaign as the election cycle progresses. In his speech, Trump reiterated his strong stance on illegal immigration, emphasizing the need to protect American jobs for black and Hispanic workers. While Philadelphia is a challenging battleground, with Biden winning the city comfortably in 2020, Trump aims to narrow the margin in this crucial region. Pennsylvania remains a key swing state and any gains in Philadelphia could significantly impact the overall results. Trump highlighted concerns about voter fraud, particularly in Philadelphia, and vowed to ensure the integrity of the upcoming election. He assured the crowd that such incidents would not be allowed to reoccur, reinforcing his commitment to a fair electoral process. A Spanish-language billboard in Miami displaying the message No to Dictators, No to Trump, alongside images of Donald Trump and former Cuban leader Fidel Castro, is sparking controversy as the 2024 presidential election approaches. According to U.S. media sources, Mad Dog Pack, a political action committee known for its anti-Trump messages, is behind the provocative advertisement. A Spanish-language billboard in Miami, Florida, featuring Donald Trump and former Cuban leader Fidel Castro, has generated significant debate in the lead-up to the 2024 U.S. presidential election. The ad, which translates in English to No to Dictators, No to Trump, was installed by Mad Dog Pack and is part of a campaign targeting battleground states to raise concerns about a potential dictatorship. Local Trump supporters have criticized the billboard and rejected the comparison. The billboard highlights the intense discussion expected in the upcoming CNN debate in Atlanta, as Trump and current President Joe Biden are neck and neck in national opinion polls, with a considerable slice of the electorate still undecided five months before the November 5th vote. The United States is in the middle of multiple weather events as the country is facing two forms of extreme weather, with the Midwest experiencing floodwaters due to heavy rainfall, while millions of Americans in other states sweltered under an intense heat wave, with temperatures reaching 41 degrees Celsius. More than 100 million people across the U.S. were under heat warnings on Sunday, with cities on the East Coast bracing for record-breaking temperatures. Cities like Baltimore and Philadelphia could touch records near 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
States like Idaho, Montana and Wyoming could see temperatures rise into the 90s, as much as 15 degrees above normal for this time of year. Temperatures have cooled in the Ohio Valley, Great Lakes and New England regions. But excessive heat in the 90s Fahrenheit continues to stretch from Virginia to New York. And while excessive heat is causing problems in many states, others are contending with flooding. This video is from Iowa's Rock Valley on Saturday after it was hit by heavy rainfall. In Wisconsin, an eyewitness captured this dramatic storm cloud moving over the state capitol. And in New Mexico, officials are responding to multiple weather events, including a dust storm, flooding and two wildfires. The National Weather Service said the extreme heat will shift to Nebraska and Kansas on Monday. Research shows climate change is driving the dangerous heat waves across the northern hemisphere this week and will continue to deliver dangerous weather for decades to come. Over to the turbulence at Boeing now. U.S. prosecutors have recommended that the Justice Department pursue criminal charges against the company. This development follows the Department of Justice's assertion that Boeing violated terms of a settlement linked to two fatal crashes involving its 737 MAX aircraft, a claim Boeing has denied. Boeing may yet face criminal charges. Prosecutors are recommending the move after finding the plane maker violated a settlement related to two fatal crashes. Boeing had been shielded from criminal charges over the loss of two 737 MAX jets in 2018 and 2019. Under the terms of a deal agreed in 2021, the company avoided prosecution for conspiracy to commit fraud over design flaws with the planes. That was in return for overhauling its compliance procedures and submitting regular reports. It also agreed to pay $2.5 billion to settle an investigation into the crashes. However, the sources say prosecutors have now concluded that Boeing did not honour the terms of the deal. That follows the mid-air blowout on another MAX jet earlier this year, which revived concerns over the firm's quality controls. There was no comment on the report from the Justice Department or Boeing, which has previously insisted it met all terms set by the 2021 deal. Appearing before Congress last week, Chief Executive Dave Calhoun insisted the firm was striving to address its problems. Much has been said about Boeing's culture. We've heard those concerns loud and clear. Our culture is far from perfect, but we are taking action and we are making progress. Now it's not clear exactly what charges might be brought, with possible penalties including a big fine. It's thought the company would be reluctant to negotiate a settlement if it meant pleading guilty, as that could see it hit with extra business restrictions. Relatives of victims in the two fatal crashes have long criticised Boeing's exemption from prosecution. They protested inside and outside Congress during Calhoun's appearance, demanding that the company face criminal charges. Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. Welcome back. The tale of a young George Washington chopping down a cherry tree might be pure myth. But recent archaeological excavations at his Mount Vernon estate uncovered a fascinating piece of history. In the mansion cellar, researchers found glass bottles filled with perfectly preserved cherries and berries, possibly gooseberries and currants. Cherries seem to play a part in President George Washington's legacy, and the newest discovery at his former home just won't let the legends go. In the cellars in Mount Vernon, Washington's Virginia plantation, archaeologists uncovered glass bottles filled with cherries and fruits. The total bottle count was 35 bottles. Researchers found the bottles accidentally, as Mount Vernon is undergoing a $40 million restoration project. Archaeologists believe the bottles were placed in storage pits in a cellar, which was then paved over with a brick floor. Besides the Washington family, Mount Vernon was also home to hundreds of enslaved men, women and children. It was likely they were the ones who picked and then preserved the fruit. Plantations like Mount Vernon are where all of these different styles of cooking and different plants and animals came together. 
with European, native, and African antecedents. And all of that stuff is woven into a new cuisine, an American cuisine, and this is part of that. So there is a lot of information that we're excited to, to get from these bottles, and they can tell us a lot about what life was like here. The U.S. Department of Agriculture plans to conduct DNA testing on the well-preserved 250-year-old fruit. Presumably, they ended up on the Washington's table um, and were eaten either as just fruit out of the bottle or they were baked into other confections or used in a different manner. Um, we do know that the Washingtons were very fond of ice cream. These could have also ended up in ice cream, who knows. While the story about George Washington not lying about cutting down a cherry tree has been all but debunked, we do know the $1 founding father ate them. And with that, we conclude our first bulletin for the week. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Sinamaya Donovan will join you next with the nightly business report. Thank you and good night.